let's talk about magic ruler. Or is it spell ruler? Ah, shit. Hey everyone, welcome back to the third installment of Dual Sauce, a series dedicated to the rich history of a children's card game. Last episode, we talked about the minefield that was a critter format and the raw impact of Metal Raiders. This was the first set to introduce counter trap cards like Solemn Judgment and Seven Tools of the Bandit, and fun fusion monsters like Skull Knight and Cybersaurus, even though you couldn't actually summon Cybersaurus. And of course, you had a slew of effect monsters like Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest. But only a couple of months after the release of Metal Raiders came the third set in Yu-Gi-Oh that compelled the game with ritual monsters and some of the most powerful spell cards even to this day. Originally released as Magic Ruler, this set came out in North America on September 16th, 2002 and worldwide by December 1st, 2004. The set is a combination of the Japanese sets of Magic Ruler and Pharaoh's Servant, the latter we wouldn't get a proper set until October in North America. Despite it not getting its own proper format, Spell Ruler is definitely one of the most interesting sets in the game. So first off, is it called Spell Ruler or Magic Ruler? Before Yu-Gi-Oh, there was, and still is, an uber-popular card game called Magic the Gathering. It's like Duel Masters with dice. Yeah, remember Duel Masters? I do. Hell, I still have my cards, but I digress. Up to this point, I've been referring to the green Yu-Gi-Oh cards as Magic cards because that's just what they were called back then. With Magic and Magic cards, you can see where the naming gets confusing. The name was changed from Magic to Spell Cards to avoid similarities and possible legal issues with Wizards of the Coast, the owners of Magic the Gathering. I'm unsure if there were any charges to begin with, however Yu-Gi-Oh took action to avoid a lawsuit anyways. From what I could gather, Wizards had no issues with the original naming. It became more of a problem when Yu-Gi-Oh started advertising the term Magic more towards the release of Magician's Force in 2003 and even attempting to copyright magic cards for themselves, which is an incredible Konami thing to do. And obviously, since magic was the first to use this term, they were very adamant to put a stop to Konami's tomfoolery. Since Magic Ruler was the first set to get retroactively renamed, I decided to discuss this bit of history now, and from now on, I will be referring to the set and subsequent cards by its proper name change. You can still hear the term Magic Cards throughout the entire Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters anime, or the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX episode where Jaden duels Dimitri, a guy who steals Yu-Gi's deck. Fun fact. But other than the magic the set caused, why does it remain impactful to the metagame? As the name suggests, spell cards were the main focus of this set. While Metal Raiders tackled just about everything else in terms of effect monsters and traps, Spell Ruler tackled the green cards and even introduced new blue cards called Ritual Cards. So let's talk about Rituals first before we get into the main course. Ritual Monsters are blue colored cards that have to be summoned with what else? A spell card. You use this new ritual spell to sacrifice a monster or monsters that equal the level of said ritual monster. For example, to summon the set's cover card Relinquish, you needed both Relinquished and Black Illusion Ritual in your hand, and either a monster in your hand or on the field that equaled Relinquish's level 1. Activate, Tribute, Summon, and voila, you just special summon a new monster. The set had only four, and most of them are pretty bad. Relinquish was powerful for its absorption effect, and Crap Turtle had an okay stat, especially when boosted with the new field spell Umi Ruka, but the rest aren't good. Hungry Burger is fun for the memes, but its stats are bad. Performance of Sword is just awful with only 1950 attack. Sure, it could beat over the Law Jin, but don't even think about Dark Elf. Although, Interestingly, Commencement Dance, Sword's Ritual Spell, is a recolored version of itself, so it's possible that this is the same monster pre and post Ritual. Since the basis of Rituals is to give up resources after gaining the proper cards, having only one Ritual with an effect in this set and the rest with mediocre stats made little impact and, let's be honest, little sense. Spell Ruler also introduced the first archetype, Tunes. Archetypes are an unofficial category of monsters that fall under the same umbrella, like 
elemental heroes, and gravekeepers. Metal Raiders had very few matching cards like Great Moth and Gate Guardian, but Toons were the first to have a theme for a deck with cards like Toon World and a bunch of Toon Monsters. Now, they too made no real impact for the overcompensation Toons received, having Summoning Sickness, paying the life points to attack, and needing Toon World on the field just to exist. I think if it wasn't for their need to wait a turn just to attack, attacking directly with a blue eyes Toon would be way more devastating. Some other monsters to note are Cyberjar that has an incredibly powerful effect to reset the field, then flooding again and refueling both players' hands, still powerful to this day. Maha Violo gains extra attack while being equipped with equipped cards like Axe of Despair or Malevolent Nuzzler. Spearcretin is a flip monster whom can revive a monster when he dies. Then, of course, you got your floaters in UFO Turtle for fire monsters, Shining Angel for lights, Mother Grizzly for water, Giant Rat for earth, Flying Kamakiri for wind, and Mystic Tomato for darks. You also have Ritual Searchers in Senju of the Ten Thousand Hands and Sonic Bird. Other spice is Electric Snake, which, when discarded by an enemy effect, you can pot a greed yourself. Greed is good. Spell Ruler didn't change the game with its monsters, save for Cyber Jar, but the floors were a great addition for digging your deck, and the ritual searches remained decent for its general search. Wait, 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 don't forget to subscribe if you haven't, because that helps me upload more videos and know that you like content like this. So now let's move on to the main course, and that is, of course, the spell cards. Wow, what a game changer. Spell Ruler is right. The spells from this set fronted the charge in 2003 and even 2004 formats. A good chunk of the cards from the set remain banned in 2020, which tells you they're powerful. Of course you had good cards like Megamorph that double attack stats if your life points are lower than your opponents, Axe of Despair that gives your monster a thousand attack boosts, and Upsard Goblin that lets you draw one card by giving your opponent 1000 life points. Pot Agreed Light, but then you have two really weird ones, one of which is Approaching Darkness, which is the only card in the game's history to flip a monster into face down attack position, a position otherwise impossible to achieve. The card caused confusion, and rightfully so, although rulings would favor normal flipping into face up attack. It has since been errata to make it face down defense, however, it has yet to be printed as such. The other odd card is Curse of Fiend, which has the unique trait of being a normal spell card that can only be activated in the standby phase, another feat that should otherwise be impossible. And now the real meat and potatoes come in the Hand Trio. Delinquent Duo, The Forceful Sentry, and Confiscation. These three cards ripped out cards from your opponent's hand either randomly or to your liking. All three of these remain banned to this upload for their power and control. Get rid of options for your opponent and possible counters. Scary stuff. And even if your opponent managed to get out a possible threat, you had more options to counter it. Snatch Steal, steal an enemy monster like Change of Heart but permanently on the field. Giant Trunade, return all spells and traps to the hand. And Mystical Space Typhoon, which allow you to selectively destroy one back row card. A true staple to spell trap removal for many, many years. And of course there's Painful Choice, which dumps cards out of your deck to gain one certain card. A card that only got strong with age for its deck thinning and masterful graveyard play. Dumb strong monsters and revive one, or just get rid of a bunch of cards you don't need. I can't express just how impactful these cards are to the meta as staple cards to the deck became much more similar than ever before unless you play dumb cheese like me and create a pyro deck that revolves around beat down and a touch of soul control. But even not viable decks like a labyrinth wall deck still use insane spells. What decks would you use in this meta? Who's that dual monster? It's Tyhone number two. Like I mentioned, Spell Ruler doesn't have a proper format. It was in between Critter and Android, which started in the following set upon the revival of said Android and subsequently the 2003 era, the first format with the World Championship. Needless to say, there's not really a good place to find decks, but given what we know of the obvious good cards in the card pool, we can take a look at possible decks. Of course you have your standard beatdown with a similar structure to Critter, just with a more powerful spell swap out. Burn decks are more viable with Just Desserts, Chain Energy, and Messenger of Peace in conjunction with Floaters to Stall. 
Crab Turtle could be viable thanks to a chunk of searchers with the boost of Umiruka and Mother Grizzly, and Mahavilo and his crazy good equip cards now is a serious threat. And of course, Relinquish can suck up enemy monsters and control the field. These are some ideas to consider apart from cheese decks like a Hungry Burger or Toon Deck or, I don't know, Shadow Ghoul. Your best bet is some variation of Beatdown or a pure control deck. And now with all the recruiters, floaters, and life point reducing cards, this format definitely picked up the pace for Yu-Gi-Oh! Really acting as a bridge between the origins of the game and the birth of the modern retro formats. The monsters didn't get too much support in new additions other than the already mentioned searchers. Most of the time, your main arsenal was still from Metal Raiders and the traps didn't add much either. The only one that is alright out of the set's five traps is Spellbinding Circle and that's not saying much. Tunes are downright terrible with no real support and a hefty upkeep just to use them. They don't even reflect their power in the anime, Quite the opposite, really, as the constant life point payout to activate Toon World and attack with Toons is ridiculous conceptually. And the only other monsters are the Rituals, and they were dead on arrival. You needed two specific cards and a sacrifice, or sacrifices, to match the monster, and all this is hoping you don't get stopped somewhere along the way by a Magic Jammer, Solemn Judgment, Mirror Force, Wall of Illusion, Raigeki, etc. Even Relinquish is tough to suggest given the amount of hand control that could easily pick off a ritual monster or spell, leaving you empty-handed with a useless card. The main focus and saving grace from Spell Ruler are the overpowered spells. They granted the game more speed and power than ever before with extremely broad cards that tighten up deck building. Like, there is no way Painful Choice could ever be brought back unless it received a major errata. And unlike Magic the Gathering or Duel Masters, there is no mana system here, making the abuse of these cards way more abundant. With that said, I do wish there was more like for a Spell Ruler format like there is for Metal Raiders. This is the last old, old school set before the following set were introduced for powerful cards all around, which we'll get to. Spell Ruler didn't revolutionize the game, and yet it showed what was possible for card design in that it wasn't complicated cards that you needed to be afraid of. It was the simple ones that gave a direct, splashable advantage. It rushed recklessly into a punishing metagame that would only be added upon when the Pharaoh's servants arrived in the final North American set of 2002.